This first slide is just to remind everyone that um, in a globalized world, we will have outbreaks of viruses every once and then. In the 80s, we had HIV, then we had the first SARS coronavirus, 2003, 2002, then the second one, the Middle East respiratory coronavirus, then Ebola, then Zika, and now the second virus. So um, I think this situation is simply uh, based on the fact that globalization, mass tourism, mega cities, and mass transport allows those um, infections uh, to travel at an unprecedented speed. And particularly for SARS-CoV-2, I think it's important to know that the case fatality rate, um, as you know, depends on age, gender, and comorbidities, um, but it is in most cases significantly less than 4%. Very different uh, compared to the first SARS coronavirus with 11% and the Middle East coronavirus with 34%. However, as you also know, SARS CoV 2 is more contagious and therefore we have many more deaths uh, worldwide by now um, uh, due to the virus, uh, close to 6 million uh, by now worldwide. Now, when we talk about um, making drugs, I think this slide is very important. We have to understand that this curve, which is the amount of virus that is in a patient, uh, changes over time. That is, when people are very sick, like on the right-hand side, there is hardly any virus left. So if you want to influence the cause of the disease, you need to treat early. You need to treat the patient in this window where they have mild or even no symptoms uh, and to bring the virus down so that it cannot cause severe disease at a later stage. As you all know, there are very potent vaccines by now in or near the market. Um, the recent one was the Novavax vaccine, which is a protein-only vaccine, um, and it has been now approved and, uh, in the EU. And then what is coming up also, I think, is interesting, a whole inactivated virus um, from Valneva, and this is even 87% active against Omicron. Um, and that may have to do that if you have the whole virus there, like in a natural infection, you may make a broader response, as uh, Ulrike already said. Now, in our countries, over 70% of the population is fully vaccinated. Now, you could ask, uh, why do we need drugs in addition? Um, but we have heard already that there is uh, this a constant evolution of variants, the so-called variants of concern. Uh, with increased transmissibility or different uh, um, pathogenic properties. And the recent one, of course, is the, is the Omicron. And very similar to what uh, Ulrike Potzer already said is that vaccine recipients five months after complete vaccination are no longer protected from Omicron infection. Zero of convalescent patients collected six or 12 months again, lose neutralizing activity against Omicron. A booster helps, but the titers are lower. And now, very importantly, when it comes to treatment, nine monoclonal antibodies um, that were clinically approved or were in development, um, here Omicron escapes most of these therapeutic um, monoclonal antibodies. And there are three, which you can see on the next slide, that, that remain uh, um, to be used. Um, and, and the red curves here are the neutralization activity against Omicron, you see in most cases, it's absolutely flat. The blue curves are delta. Um, one antibody, silgavimab, um, will have some neutralizing activity also in a combination. And so trovimab as well as adintrevimab, those are the few um, monoclonal antibodies left um, uh, that we can use for treating people. And this slide shows you now the worldwide curves of infections in blue, the new cases, and you see this enormous peak of Omicron with nearly 4 million cases worldwide. And on the right-hand side, you see the, um, the, the uh, deaths coming up, and the next slide shows this even more uh, clearly. Even though we think that, and it's true, that Omicron will cause less severe infections, uh, we still see it with this blue curve of Omicron, we still see the death curve coming up. And that leads me to the conclusion that we do need, in addition to vaccines, uh, another strong response uh, scientifically and also later in the clinics, of course, and that this is drugs. And that the goal of, for the drugs is uh, to complement vaccination, uh, to rapid inhibit viral replication in the upper respiratory tract, once people are infected, uh, to reduce the disease progression and by reducing the virus, also um, to reduce um, 
uh, infection uh, you could go into other people. So that this would also have an impact on the epidemiology. And when we think about which would be the right drugs for our targets for our drugs against the coronavirus, we should avo avoid this part here, which is the attachment phase of the virus. Uh, here you see the cellular receptor, the ACE2, and here you see the spike. And as I said, all vaccines are directed against spikes. All monoclonal antibodies so far are directed against spikes. So this, I think, uh, is not an ideal place to do a um, drug development. We should go to very conserved enzymes here in the red boxes. Uh, there is a viral protease that is quite conserved and a viral polymerase um, that's needed for making the new RNA for the new virus uh, to be made. And those are the two targets um, I'll be talking about now. Um, the fastest way, of course, uh, to find a new drug is to repurpose old drugs. And this was done with remdesivir. Um, that compound is a broad spectrum antiviral drug active against several coronavirus and, and other RNA viruses. And it leads to a premature termination of RNA transcription. That is, it's a polymerase inhibitor. Um, it was first developed against Ebola, but there it didn't meet its efficacy goals. And now it's approved uh, by the Food and Drug Administration and the European Medicines Agency for hospitalized adult and pediatric patients and since January also for non-hospitalized patients. And when you talk about this early phase of the infection, I think this is exactly where you should uh, use such drugs in patients. The trouble if people are at home in, in uh, quarantine, um, this drug needs to be applied IV and therefore it's not optimal. But there are more drugs to come. The next uh, drug, um, this, this uh, just shows you the uh, repurposing, um, it was had very low numbers uh, of, of uh, um, IC50 against SARS coronavirus 2 and against the Middle East virus. And it's about tenfold less active against the SARS coronavirus 2. But as I said, the drug is still useful and it's being used and recommended. The first oral drug to be discussed among the polymerase inhibitors um, is uh, this MK882 or Lagatrio. Um, again, uh, it results in, um, in mutations in the newly formed viral RNA so that the virus uh, can no longer survive. Um, it has shown activity in several mo models uh, of SARS coronavirus 2. And there was a recent study in patients early in the infection where it reduced the risk of hospitalization and death. Uh, by 30%. Uh, since January, this drug is available um, in uh, Germany as well. And here you see the data in cell culture, 0.1 micromolar uh, against SARS-CoV-1 and 0.3 against SARS-CoV-2. So it's an activity very similar to remdesivir that I showed you before. And the third polymerase inhibitor is uh, bemifosbuvir. Um, it was originally developed against HCV, hepatitis C. Um, it interestingly, addresses two targets in the polymerase reaction and therefore has a low level of resistance. Um, and the phase three study is ongoing. However, the company decided to amend the study because in this study, they had many patients who had no high risk for a, a late development of um, severe disease. And so they will now include more patients with a high risk to really show better uh, whether this drug um, is helpful in these cases. Now, the second uh, part uh, will be drugs against the protease of SARS coronavirus 2. Uh, this, in my view, mind, is, is a very interesting target as well because it's highly conserved among alpha, beta, and gamma coronaviruses. Um, and because of the SARS CoV 1 outbreak, that I mentioned before in 2002 and 2003, um, inhibitors had already been identified. So then this uh, compound was first um, uh, tested against um, uh, coronavirus, uh, panel of coronavirus, and had really low nanomolar to picomolar range activity. And it was the company then made additional candidates, and 732, 332 is the first oral candidate. Um, uh, with, which has in a recent study shown that they could reduce 90% of the hospitalizations and deaths compared to uh, placebo in high risk adults with uh, COVID-19. So I think it's a very remarkable 
uh, thing if you can really reduce hospitalization and deaths by 89%. Um, and here you see the two drugs. This is the active moiety against the coronavirus. Ritonavir is only added because uh, this is uh, rather quickly um, um, metabolized in uh, humans, and this drug is added to stabilize this. And the final um, uh, drug then is called Paxlovid. Again, 90% reduced risk for hospitalization and death. Now, since this is a good idea, uh, other companies, of course, try to come up with protease inhibitors as well. Um, Theonori has one, which is non-covalent. Uh, unfortunately, the chemical structure is not published yet. I looked for it, but couldn't find it. Um, it again has antiviral activity against all the currently circulating the variants, which of course is clear because uh, it is again a, polymer, a protease inhibitor and is not attacking the S protein. And there is a phase two, uh, phase three um, Japanese study ongoing from which we know that there is a rapid virus reduction in the treated patients compared to placebo and that so far the drug seems to be very well tolerated. Another fast follower is ALG, and here you see the data comparing with the Pfizer drug, with the first uh, protease inhibitor uh, oral that I showed you, and you see that the ALG drug is about a, um, a factor of 10 more active throughout the different alpha, delta, and Omicron variants. Here in green is the other data for Omicron, and it is also active against SARS-CoV-1 um, and against additional coronaviruses which infect humans and cause um, colds. So also this fast follower, I think, is a very interesting um, and potentially useful drug. Um, uh, and this company wants to start phase one in the fourth quarter of this year. And from Germany, um, and this is um, a slide I got from Rolf Hilgenfeld, there is this 13B series of um, protease inhibitors in development um, with um, the active diastereomere IC50.14 um, against the virus, um, uh, against the, the protease and 0.4 against uh, the virus in cell culture. So hopefully this compound class will also make it uh, to the clinic soon and, and will contribute um, to being able to fight uh, corona on a different level uh, as compared to vaccines, but I'm very convinced since we, we heard that vaccines lose the efficacy over time, um, that we will need a second line of defense against this virus. This is at least what I'm very convinced about. So let me summarize um, the experiences from the previous outbreaks of two other coronaviruses were helpful for vaccine development. One new one had to attack S protein and were also helpful for drug development. Um, and based on this, of course, the first vaccine could be made very quickly. Um, and repurposing of drugs against earlier outbreaks uh, was helpful, as I just um, told you, the old polymerase and um, um, protease inhibitors that were, can now be used against SARS coronavirus 2. But I personally believe that we need to continue our efforts to generate highly specific or, or inhaled drugs for early intervention. Um, so what we have now is, is good, but it's not good enough. We should really, really try to still increase the efficacy of those drugs and the fewer um, follow-up drugs that I mentioned to you, at least in the protease um, uh, field, uh, seem to be uh, good candidates uh, for that. So, down here is my conclusion. Vaccines have made a great contribution, of course, to control the pandemic, but for treating infection with variants, vaccine breakthroughs, or unvaccinated people, highly efficient drugs are still urgently needed. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this was excellent. Um, also for keeping the time. Apparently my beeper is not uh, really um, to be heard. I try to do my best to that the next speaker can hear it. Apologize. So are there any questions from the audience? Maybe I start. Uh, ah, yeah, now um, I give the word to Thomas Dauma. Shall I read it? Uh, any data or expectations of differences in terms of secondary resistance of these antivirals? Question mark. That's a very relevant question, of course. Um, um, 
also against the protease inhibitors and against the polymerase inhibitors, uh, mm -hmm. will make resistance over time, that's for sure. And I mentioned the third polymerase inhibitor from the company Aptea, um, which, was, which was originally a compound made against hepatitis C that has two different modes of action on the polymerase and has a very low resistance uh, potential. Um, for the other drugs, we may on the long run have to combine them. Um, and that's also one additional reason why we need more drugs in the future and why we need a very intensive research on that. Uh, so we can combine drugs with different modes of action to combat mm -hmm. development of resistance. I do expect it not to be as fast as for HIV, but for HIV, combining drugs with different modes of action, of course, was a very good strategy. Mm -hmm. And as I said, on the long run, we may have to do that for SARS coronavirus too as well. Yeah, it took a long time to develop it anyway. Yeah. Christian Bogdan has a question. Maybe you ask it yourself, please. Yeah, I ask it myself. For, thank you for your presentation. I'm, I'm wondering how you actually uh, sort of judge the, the fact that molnupiravir has quite some mutagenic potential and the Paxlovid has a huge pharmacological interactions, which is a real concern if you consider the population that is targeted to be treated. Absolutely. Uh, these are both very relevant questions. Let me start with the molnupiravir. Um, indeed, it has this high mutational capacity, and that's why it works against the virus. But of course, the concern is that it may also uh, cause mutations in humans. On the other hand, uh, you treat only for seven days, so it's a short course. But that's the reason, by the way, why molnupiravir is not uh, indicated for, for children. Um, and Paxlovid, you're also right, uh, because uh, the, this drug is metabolized very quickly in humans. You need to add this additional drug, Ritonavir, which again is not an ideal situation, but that's what we have right now. And, and that's why, again, why I'm asking or really pushing that, that there should be much more research done on making additional drugs that have better properties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, as a mitochondrial researcher, I'm uh, concerned about the effect of these um, uh, polymerase inhibitors on the T7 virus-like RNA polymerase uh, in mitochondria. Is this usually routinely tested with all these drugs? I mean, all drugs um, that are uh, developed and, and, and that are allowed to be used in humans undergo testing also for mitochondrial toxicities. Mm -hmm. and on that must have happened to these drugs as well, but I that don't have any data at hand right now. So I yeah. assume um, that there is no toxicity in that regard due to polymerase reactions. Mm. At least not but under I, the concentration of any, of any um, where you took this polymerase and, and the drug and, and tested it uh, uh, in, the, in the biochemical assay. I'm not aware of those data. Mm. 